April, um, Rich, is Rich on the call? Looks like he is. Richie Rich. <clears throat> I'm not sure if Rich or Chase is going to give that. Hi, I'm here. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, are you planning to give the uh, place enhancement grant? Yes, I will. Okay. So I sent it to you if you yeah. want to. I, I saw it. Yeah, I just want to make sure that April has it so that you can um, share screen. Great. Let me send it, April. I will send it to you now. You, you don't need to send her the PowerPoint. Oh, okay, cool. No, you'll just share screen on your end when and when it's when it's your turn. Awesome. Just she just needs to give you the ability to do it. Oh, there we go. Okay. <coughs> Who has called in from three two three eight five 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 two five eight three? Uh good afternoon, Sergeant uh, Neil Wank, LAPD Hollywood. How are you? Hey, Neil. I'm great. This is Chris Larson. Excellent. Good to hear from you. Yeah, thank, thanks for joining us today. You got it. My pleasure. Hey, David. Chris, how are you? I'm well, sir. How are you? I'm okay. Thank you. Very good. Hey, Leslie. Hi, hi Chris. <laughs> hi, April. Hi, Leslie. <laughs> hi, Leslie. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Not going to have another uh, mishap like we had earlier this week. No, no. I'm going to explain it to you on a separate call. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Hey, Chris. Drew. Hey, Drew. <laughs> Sure, like if you were in. Hey, Mike. Hello. Glad you're here, man. Good to see you. Thank you. We have somebody on named uh, Francisco Dorada. Um, are you here to provide public comment today? Hey, Jeff. Hey, everyone. Hey, Mike Pogo. Hello. Hey, Dave Torden. See you logging in. Hey, Chad. Hi, Chris. Hi, everyone. Gotcha. Wow, was that a crow? Hello, everybody. Here yet? Well, I've not seen Bill yet. It looks like uh, got... as soon as Bill is here, there's a quorum. Yeah, we've got a great turnout. Hey, Jeffrey. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hey, Amy. Chris, before we get started, I just want to thank you again for um, all the updates. It was really so helpful for us, so I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Appreciate you saying that. 
I'm glad that I don't have to write them every morning now. Uh, <laughs> it's nice where it's just a little bit more normal out. Hey, well, I enjoyed I enjoyed writing them. It was just all the uh, surveying the district every morning and trying to get intel from folks. That was every morning, over and over and over again. Yeah, you did a great job with it. So, Brian, you're sideways. I'm uh, still. I, I, I'm looking forward. I, I, I'm straight on my phone. Oh, not his, straight. His business is sideways. Yeah. <laughs> not him. <laughs> Brian, I'm dizzy looking sideways. at you. Hey, everybody. Hey, Bill. Hey, Bill. Do we have a quorum? We do, sir. Yeah. Great. So, should we get started? I think. How so? I'll make a call. Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing? First of all, hello. Hey, Bill. Can't hello. wait to see you all in person sometime soon. Um, call to order, um, housekeeping and roll call. All right, um, for roll call, Bill Humphrey, to you, Katie, Zand Katie Zandona, Frank Stefan, here, Drew Planting, here, Leslie Bloomberg, here, Amy Brown, here, Brian Fold, here, upside down. No, you're right side up. Here. Right. That's work. You're, you're, you're evened out now. What a stud. Thank you. Finally. Stay right there. All right. And David Gaida. Here. Michael Gargano. Here. David Green. Here. Chase Gordon. Here. Chad Lewis. Here. Jeff Mogavum. Here. Michael Nazal. Here. Mike Pogazelski. Here. Fred Rosenthal. Uh, David Twerdon. Here. Larry Wilkes. Here. Uh, Monica Yamada. Matt, the song is Folk Road Tour. Hey, everybody. Adam Lovelady here from Toyota. Yes. I just want to talk to you about our. One second, Martin. Thank you. Very much. One second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there any Folk Road All right. Um, Antonio Zambardi. <coughs> All right, and we have a quorum. Okay, and I just saw Katie. Katie has joined. Okay, you got her? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, and just one more item, a quick item um, for housekeeping. If there are any members of uh, the public who would like to participate in public comment, um, the chair will create that opportunity here shortly. Um, if you would like to participate in public comment, uh, please use the raise hand button um, that is in the chat area. Um, just want to raise that and um, April can unmute you uh, so that you can participate um, and address the board for a period of uh, no more than uh, two minutes. Great. All right, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, so are there, there, were no, there are no public comments then? Is that what I'm hearing? Right. Well, okay, great. Okay, approval of the minutes. So we have the, I hope everybody had an opportunity to take a look at the minutes of the May 21st meeting. Does anybody have any questions on it before we uh, make an action? All right, so can, can I have a motion to um, approve the minutes of May 21st? Move. Move, can I have a second? Got that? Okay, good. All those uh, in favor, please raise your hand. Right. And anybody, uh, please uh, take your hand down, lower your hand. Anybody, is anybody uh, uh, against the minutes or is anybody abstaining? Do you have any abstention? Okay, good. All right, we'll move on to the Treasury's report with Drew. Hi, everybody. I hope you're well. Uh, this is a short report, which is overall good news. Uh, the uh, Finance Committee met, you'll recall, uh, uh, last board meeting, we talked about uh, the uh, tax returns for both the uh, HPOA and CHC. Uh, both forms were distributed to the board. They were reviewed by the committee, and they were, they were filed with the IRS. So that task has been completed. Uh, let's see. The committee re uh, has recommended that staff pursue an extension of the organization's current line of credit. You'll recall that uh, with Monica's help, we uh, secured 
a, a $1 million line of credit with City National Bank. Uh, it, it, and with all, with all uh, letters of credit, they have, an ex, they have a timestamp, they have an expiration. So we're gonna re-up it at a cost of approximately $2,500 uh, per year, which the uh, Finance Committee and staff believe is a very, very fair price to pay for the amount of optionality it, it gives us. So, um, uh, and unless any if, unless anyone objects, we're gonna we're gonna renew it. Uh, we reviewed uh, Chris's presentation about the proposed budget amendments and and largely supported, in fact, wholly supported his uh, recommendations. He'll go over the specifics with you uh, today. Uh, our burn rate, if you will, our, our monthly expenses are running consistent between five. 550 and 600 and 610, 615 thousand dollars a month. So no material changes there. Uh, we continue to monitor, as monitor as a, as as we have done and as I've reported each month about any sort of uh, any any serious changes to uh, uh, you know accounts receivable and delinquencies in in uh, in payments. Uh, there are no material changes uh, from from last report. So that's good news. And uh, we. We have a fairly steady cash position. We're in we're in we're in very good shape. Uh, we're gonna we'll certainly you know as as I mentioned we're certainly gonna you know take a little bit of a hit from this COVID thing, but I I believe that ultimately we'll get full recovery and from a cash position the bid is in, on solid footing uh, financially. So uh, I I I would uh, move that we accept the May thirty first twenty twenty. Uh, Nineteen twenty-eight financial statements that you that re you received in your board packet. Please. Before I request a second, uh, does anybody have any questions for Drew on his, on the his financial summary or on the motion? We're all good. Okay. Um, all those in favor of um, the uh, motion as presented for the. Uh, financials um, for May 31st, 2020, the statement. Would you please raise your hand? There I go. And anybody opposed? Anybody abstained? Do I see two abstentions? Michael Levin. So good, I'm they, 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 I voted. Good. I voted yes. Yeah. So those those have been approved. Um, great. Um, Can I ask just one quick question before we move on? Um, maybe please to, to, to Chris. Is there going to be any way to track um, if businesses are closing or moving out of Hollywood in the wake of this going forward, and, and how if those businesses are moving or closing, how that may impact? Our assessments for the next year? Yeah, so um, our assessments are tied to um, property massing and um, it's a three-part um, basically building characteristic formula that is applied to linear front footage, uh, the land area, as well as um, the overall built square footage on a particular parcel. And so assessments are based on the amount of physical space that a building basically takes up within the district occupancy levels do not change assessments in that regard. Um, and so um, let's say a particular property lost a ground floor tenant, and maybe a restaurant went out, out of business or something like that, the, the property assessment does not change. Um, and so with regards to this particular type of public finance tool, it is a fairly predictable tool in that regard because um, our assessment level only changes as the built environment changes. Um, whether buildings come down or go up is when our assessment changes. Um, that being said, the other part of your question about tracking businesses that leave, um, that is something that we are doing. Um, and so um, our, our, our operations team, um, as they're out in the field, as we are collecting information and seeing signs about a, a storefront business closing due to, to COVID or whatever it might be, um, we are collecting and aggregating that information. Um, and um, we also are, are monitoring social media of many of the businesses in the bid um, because we want to be able to measure that overall impact 
and you're going to start to see the first representations of um, of that measurement as a part of our second quarter report, which will be released later in July. Um, so that is something that we feel is really important as we begin to to know and understand um, how deep the impacts of the pandemic will be. That's all great. Thank you so much. Yep. The next item is the uh, submittal on the of the tax returns. I think he's already covered that. He's covered it all right? Yeah. Budget and any other thing on the budget amendments, we're okay there? Yeah, no, I've got a presentation on that one. Okay, go ahead. All right, I am going to share screen. All right, so um, I have talked a little bit about uh, budget amendments and I really want to give the full context to the board. Uh, the Finance Committee did um, uh, review this uh, presentation um, and um, and, and we're supportive of, of the concepts that I have sort of recommended here to make the most of, of our budget conditions. So um, why would we need to amend our budget? Um, we are looking at increases in delinquency and revenue due to COVID-19. Uh, and that has to do with a couple of different factors that I'll explain in more detail. Um, that there certainly are new priorities that emerge um, in the context of, of the economic crisis. Um, that I think causes us to revisit the priorities that we set uh, almost a year ago. Uh, we have had some cost savings um, in certain line items, and we want to make sure that we are reprioritizing those dollars where possible uh, so that we can mobilize those funds. Um, and then uh, 2020 itself presents some rare opportunities uh, for capital, such as potentially moving our office space and or building out uh, the space at El Centro for the new hospitality program. Uh, which would be potentially eligible for the utilization of our old bid funds uh, because those are capital expenditures. Um, additionally, I just want to remind everybody that the city clerk also applies downward pressure on any fund balance um, and uh, would like us to end the fiscal year as close to zero as possible, uh, which is also why it is important that we maintain that line of credit so that we have operating capital as we go into the new year. Um, some headlines for the budget amendment process is that in totality, and this is the most important one, if, if you are supportive of everything I'm proposing, um, which um, the net impact would result in a quarter million dollar, what I call an opportunity fund um, for reallocation and reprioritization for Q3 and Q4 uh, for the organization. Uh, to do that, it means that we have to take advantage of uh, utilizing some of those old bid funds. Um, in the top right is the balances there. So we have about 450,000 in old bid funds. And I'm proposing that we use approximately 165,000 of that um, to move it out of operating capital and into um, using that basically that CapEx fund. Um, also looks at transitioning part of the lighting investments um, into old bid funds. Um, and would result in a net carry forward of about 150,000. Last year, we are, we've ended the year with about a 480,000 um, uh, carry forward um, and got a lot of uh, grief from the, the city clerk's office as, as a result of that. So on the revenue side, um, the net story here is about $200,000 um, in diminished revenue, and that comes from a couple of different sources that are delineated here. Uh, the good news is that the biggest one of those is the parking meter revenue, uh, which was then offset by a planned carry forward of $195,000. That parking meter revenue is, um, I, I guess, best, the best way I can describe it right now is that we have no news um, uh, from the city about their intent to move forward with that program. But what we do know is that here we are transitioning into Q3, um, and we and, and even the first communities don't have their agreements in place. And so I don't believe we can count on that revenue this year as, as what I once hoped that we could. Um, so we are looking at uh, some proposed changes uh, to each one of our program areas um, in, in place management. We see uh, going uh, decreasing by about $180,000. Um, and that would then uh, reflect actual and anticipated costs for the two quarters remaining uh, between clean, safe, and hospitality. Um, we have uh, proposed to continue keeping our media relations project on, on, on ice for this year. 
Um, and then we did have a small savings in personnel costs due to uh, the delayed hire at the end of the first quarter of our ops manager. Um, under goal two, uh, much more significant here. And some of that is related to savings on tree trimming, uh, reallocation of, of lighting expense, as I talked about, um, some smaller savings on waste receptacles, um, essentially eliminating professional development uh, for anything that would be travel related for the remainder of the year. Um, and then the elimination of wayfinding system repairs, since we do not have that parking uh, revenue agreement in place with the city, and then that media relations piece. I'm also proposing that we increase um, the allocation towards public art projects um, within uh, this, this area. And um, Chase will give more detail on that. And it's really reflective of the success um, of the first round of our place enhancement grant program. Goal three um, looks at a reduction of about $30,000. Again, um, you know, we've got uh, basically some realized savings and then overall, um, challenges associated with mobilizing some of these funds. Things like engaging people is tough right now in COVID land. Um, it's tough for us to put together a special event when you can't get people together. So things like that, we're basically saying that let's reprioritize those dollars to make them of use in the short term. And then under advocacy and economic development, again, things like getting the media together to do tours of property. Right now, we, we still don't believe we can do that. Um, and so uh, looking at putting those projects on, on, on the shelf for now. Um, and we've already realized some savings from doing things like not printing the Q1 reports uh, because we don't have a lot of in-person interactions these days. Um, and so uh, thinking about how we can uh, save where we, where we can and where we have saved. Um, and they also see the research manager, which was brought on as a part-time position, also created a cost savings um, in personnel. General administration, um, this one's a little higher due to an error in our budgeting process, um, which we did not include the health benefit costs for our admin personnel. Um, so we need to go ahead and correct that. Um, and we are proposing to maintain a $10,000 legal cushion for um, the, the lawsuit um, regarding um, the fire that occurred in the property a, a couple of years ago. Um, so we are going to maintain that cushion there. Fees, contingency, and delinquency. Uh, this is where we are increasing our delinquency um, and I want to be as conservative as possible on this line item. Um, and this really gets to the fact that while property owners are technically still on the hook to pay their assessments, um, the, the, the city is uh, not penalizing those that are late collected. Um, and so until that changes, uh, we, we still need to be planning on, on a, in a conservative way. Um, and so all that totals up into a draft amended budget. And this is not a full budget for your consideration. It's meant to be a conversation starter uh, because I think the real conversation is, is number one is, are you supportive of basically the moves that I'm recommending to free up capital um, for the purpose of this year so that we can pivot and reallocate strategically? Um, and then that reallocation is about a quarter million dollars within that context of an opportunity fund. Um, and so I did mention bringing this to the finance committee. Um, I am hopeful to bring this to each one of our standing uh, boards and committees uh, for discussion uh, before I um, really put the final pen to paper in sketching out a proposed, an amended budget for your consideration and adoption. So that's a little bit about where we are. And I want to pause there and just see if there's any comments from members of the board um, who would like to share any thoughts that they might have about priorities uh, for reallocation from that opportunity fund. Does anybody have any questions, um, comments? I'm surprised, great. Um, okay. The only comment I have is, um, you know, I was, the wayfinding repairs, you said you're gonna eliminate that because we don't have the parking revenue, but geez, keeping those wayfinding signs if they get all smashed up and wrecked up over the course of the rest of the year, does that mean we're not going to fix them? They're just going to sit out there and look horrible? Yeah, I think that's an important question. I think it's one that we, you know, that's a conversation that we need to have, you know, with the council office as well. Um, there were some repairs that were made last year uh, because there was uh, funding remaining within the contingency line item of that project. I don't know if those funds exist any longer, but uh, Dan, anything you want to chime in on that? Uh no <laughs> not i mean yes no 
I think you described it accurately, the pickle that DOT, along with everybody else, finds itself in. I will say for whatever it's worth, especially with the uh, high level of First Amendment activity occurring in Hollywood over the last few weeks, I have been driving around and trying to keep an eye on the wayfinding signs. They seem to have fared spectacularly well so far, um, but, you know, We'll, we'll see. But so, yeah, I don't have anything more definitive at this time, but Chris, you and I should talk separately. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody have a, a other comment? Again, you're going to take this to all the different committees. So everybody has time between now and the next board meeting to reflect on this. And if anybody wants copies of what, um, you know, you have, I think you have a copy of the presentation. Please comment back to me or or or, um, or or Chris. Okay. Great. So we'll move on from there. Um, so chair's report. A um, couple things, and again, I, I know they're going to be talked on later in the agenda, but I just want to go down. I'm going to run down a list of things that I'm focused on, without a lot, without a lot of comment. One is the board statement reflecting Black Lives Matter. We're, that was something that. The executive committee has uh, worked on diligently, and we're looking forward to getting comments back from the board on that momentarily. We're gonna, I know that we're gonna talk about armed security today versus unarmed security. Uh, quite a lot going on, and vast understatement, quite a lot going on in terms of um, policing right now, and we're, we are sort of in a way our own police force to some degree. Um, third for me is, um, Leadership on economic development and this retail strategy. You know, we're going to talk about that, and it's somewhat related to shift of, of priorities, but I'm going to hold that for later as well. Um, the nominating committee has been formed, as I mentioned. So uh, I'm assuming everybody on this call is still who's going to stay on the board is still out there nominating forms. I believe they're due tomorrow. They are. So please do that. Um, I don't want to give up, even with everything going on with COVID, with the um, Black Lives Matter, with the retail uh, vacancy problem, the budget. I do not want to leave. I do not want to lose sight of the homelessness issue, which continues to be a high priority. I think in terms of how we are involved or how we structure that around our 501c3. Um, continuing strategic plan momentum. I think we still have it. But we're not dead in the water. We're going to continue to move forward. Um, on the office side, um, with Chad helping out there, we're looking at an alternative potentially staying where we're at or renovating versus um, moving to another location. And then that's reflective of cost um, this year or early next year. And the budget has been presented by. Um, Chris and um, and by um, by Drew. So um, with that, that's a lot. That's, that's, there's a lot going. This you know, there's a lot going on right now. Even though we're all doing this remotely, um, I would like to say kudos to the uh, Chris and his team. They've done a really good job communicating to property owners about what's going on in Hollywood during the protests. And, and the vandalism and everything that's going on, I actually found it a great tool to feed to my executives at Hudson Pacific and other of our investors. So I found it to be, I found it to be a really good tool and I think it's um, symbolic of uh, how the Hollywood Partnership has transformed into an organ, a proactive organization that's providing solid, good information and points of view to um, our members and to the community at large. Uh, the executive committee had a meet over the weekend to talk about lots of things, all the way down to the uh, famous or infamous, whatever we're going to call it, the Black Lives Matter logo mural painted on Hollywood Boulevard. Um, there was, we had quite a bit of discussion on that. Uh, and at this point, we are not involved with the removal of it or the retention of it. And uh, it's not, it's something that was done outside of the Hollywood partnership. But again, Again, I want to thank the uh, executive committee for spending a lot of quite a bit of time providing insight and direction on that. Um, 
And then Chris's team's been working really, really hard. There's a lot going on um, with, um, uh, with, with all the tremendous worldwide attention Hollywood's getting. And uh, I think that we've done a very, very good job managing, um, managing our organization, managing uh, information, and basically trying to do our best to help the community and the property owners. So that's my update. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Michael? Could you unmute him? Um, regarding the mural on Hollywood Boulevard, do we know when it's going to be removed and or when we're going to open the uh, the boulevard again? Because it's been a it's been a week since, and I've been getting complaints from my tenants saying that the closure of the boulevard has made things harder to get in, get by and have brought less people to the boulevard. So. I I will pass I guess, it over to my esteemed colleague from the um, Councilman O'Farrell's office. I was just going to say, I can speak to that. It uh, should be, uh, uh, I'll answer your question in two parts. The mural itself is likely only to be up probably for about another two or so weeks, give or take, okay. something like that. The intent is to open the street up to vehicular traffic within the next few days. So uh, I can't give an exact date, uh, but council member uh, O'Farrell's direction, and I think uh, what's, we're gonna work it out so that it's there, uh, continues to be there temporarily for a relatively brief period of time, but that vehicles have the ability essentially sort of to go around it. That's the latest, and I um, will, should know more first thing tomorrow morning, but that's the idea. As so you're gonna put cones out there around the mural? There'll be some kind of, uh, some sort of infrastructure uh, that the city puts out there to uh, do, I don't know if it's going to be cones, Bill, but it'll be something of that nature. Something like that, okay. Yeah. Michael, thanks for the question. That's a good one. Other questions? Not Great. seeing any other hands. I'm sorry. I don't see anybody else. No. All right, great. So let's move on. Um, thanks for your time, buddy. So I'm going to walk onto the Walk of Fame streetscape restoration. Yep. Uh, so that one is in my camp as well. Um, so hopefully you have a presentation in front of you that um, says Walk of Fame repairs. Um, and I uh, want to give you an overview of phase one and then exciting news regarding phase two. Um, so most of you uh, uh, may know that um, thanks to Rana, I was appointed uh, to the Hollywood Historic Trust um, as an appointee of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and I have been working with the trust to serve as the project manager on this effort. Um, I don't have, hopefully have to tell any of you where the Walk of Fame is, but this little map will just serve as a reminder. Um, some people do forget about Vine on occasion, uh, but it is a, a long stretch. Um, and then within phase one, um, this picked up Sycamore to McCadden on the south, um, and then Orange to McCadden on the north. Um, and so this is roughly about, I'm just going to call it about 85% of uh, the Hollywood frontage uh, that corresponds with our TDOZ, uh, which is, of course is a, um, an overlay district of our bid. Um, and so but we built a partnership a couple of months ago between the TDOZ and the Hollywood Historic Trust uh, to, to approve and advance a scope of work in phase one um, for the area that's highlighted here in dark blue. Um, and you can see that as a component of the overall Walk of Fame. So this is about $270,000 worth of work. Um, before uh, we had... <laughs> Um, need for repairs aplenty. Um, and so I, this is just a motley assortment of different photographs that we took um, just to kind of give you a sense of the pre-existing condition. And this, of course, is the sidewalk that people have traveled all across the globe to come and take pictures of. Um, and they probably were taking pictures of different sections than I took pictures of for these uh, slides. Um, but we were in a sort of a desperate need uh, for repair, both for cosmetic reasons, um, as well as um, liability and uh, trip hazard uh, uh, instances. So you can see the sort of like the preponderance here of, of damages, um, including damages uh, to many of our beloved stars. 
Um, and so this is just a quick little tutorial uh, for those of you who walk the Walk of Fame every day and maybe don't know how you how you build a Walk of Fame um, or how you restore it. Uh, it really works through these these eight stages as a part of this process. So um, if you're out in the, in the coming weeks and you see these orange X's um, within the, 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 the project area, uh, this is basically communication from the project leads down to uh, the different um, staff that help to perform the labor um, as a part of it. So they're marking that area uh, for various things. Um, then it starts into demolition. So they're gonna actually uh, tear this up the same way that you would break up a concrete sidewalk. Um, and so that you can establish a very firm and um, level setting bed. And from there, uh, they basically do the form work, uh, which is the metal work in this context uh, to create the space where the eventual terrazzo aggregate will fill. Uh, here's an example of that same context uh, for a star before the star is filled with uh, the pink terrazzo composite. Um, mixing and, and, and um, pouring the terrazzo is, um, is, is the next phase after that basically that setting bed is put into place. Um, it is mixed on site, uh, which is going to be a, a combination of both the terrazzo as well as other uh, elements to create the concrete um, and it is poured into place. Um, some people think that um, terrazzo is like marble and it is sort of uh, chiseled off the side of a mine somewhere deep in Italy, but um, in fact it is mi mixed on site um, and poured into place, uh, again more like a concrete material. Um, and then you get into the grinding process. So after it is cured, and, and normally it's, it takes about 24 to 72 hours, depending on the humidity for uh, the terrazzo to cure in place. So if you see a portion like you see here on the right, um, that is curing terrazzo and it is waiting uh, the grinding process. Um, and the grinding process goes from about a, um, on the left, that's a diamond uh, pointed grinder. And so that's gonna be the roughest portion. And then it gets into um, some finished grinding over time. So you'll see a lot of this right now on the south side of the boulevard, which is uh, the grinding of the cured terrazzo, um, which is going to help to create that shiny finish. Um, and then ultimately a, a series of grouting um, and uh, much more finer uh, grinding to follow. Uh, we are preparing 25 stars as a part of the initial scope of work. Um, and you can see Mr. Collins' repaired star on the left uh, with a freshly uh, poured uh, pink terrazzo uh, fill. Here's a couple of uh, before and after photos to show you the sense of, of the scale of the repairs um, and some more of the repaired stars that are now finished. Um, and that helps to produce a, um, a fully restored section of, walk, of the Walk of Fame. Um, one of those blocks is now finished, uh, the block between Sycamore and Orange on the south side of the block. Uh, but just as a status report, um, they did lose about three and a half days of work uh, due to the, pro uh, the, pro the protests. Um, and uh, the scope is about 33% complete at this time. Um, if you want to see grinding and polishing, go to the block between Orange and Highland. Um, or if you want to see the earliest stages of the demo um, and the curing, uh, it's just the next block over to the east. Uh, the current schedule is trending for completion of phase one in July. So uh, excited to share with, with this group that last week um, the, the, the trust met um, and I neglected to mention Jeff Briggs who serves as our legal counsel is also a member of the trust uh, who, was, who was at this meeting. But uh, we did propose, uh, Rana and, I, and Dan and I worked on a scheme to advance um, the next section of work. Um, and this is a, approximately uh, $457,000 um, and it would take the area that you see here outlined in this peach color. Um, and so that would be Whitley on the north and in carrying it all the way to the terminus of the Walk of Fame um, at Gower on the north side of the street. It would include the eastern block of Vine, um, as well as the southern portion between McCadden all the way to Argyle. Um, and so that will help to carry in that southern sidewalk experience, basically all the way from Sycamore uh, really to El Centro, because thanks to the El Centro development, um, that block has been uh, almost fully restored as well. Uh, phase one and two combined, um, you start to see how these different phases add up. 
Um, my estimation is that this would uh, result in about 66% uh, uh, repair of the total Walk of Fame. Um, and so that is a significant amount of work that we are hoping to have completed by the end of this calendar year. Um, the trust has been motivated uh, to advance this effort, particularly given the fact that we have lower footfall rates uh, during this time period of the pandemic. Uh, and so looking at this as an opportunity to get as much work done to be able to reopen Hollywood Boulevard and it's in a beautiful uh, restored state um, for folks once they return back to our community. Um, I will say that uh, both Dan and I and, and others on the trust, uh, we don't wanna stop after phase two either. We think that there is uh, a good reason to, to continue this work uh, with the goal being of, of, of hopefully uh, continuing full restoration of the Walk of Fame. Um, these are some of the, the different tools that we use to assess uh, the current condition. Uh, so uh, this is one of our star polishers out. Uh, this is, he's actually remo removing graffiti uh, from one of the, the protests, um, but um, you can see that the process of maintaining that asset is one that requires labor nearly 24 hours a day um, and every so often significant capital investments. I'm happy to answer any question on that, but I really wanted to make sure that this board uh, was briefed about um, this incredible work that's being moved forward. And uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, Dan and Rana and Jeff uh, for their help um, in, uh, in helping to move uh, this project, both phase one and phase two forward, as well as members of the TDOZ that um, were also financial contributors to the effort. Great. Any other questions? That's great. It's great news, by the way, that we have that funding. Fantastic. The pictures don't do it justice. It looks spectacular. It looks fantastic. Uh, Very Jeff important as part of our physical improvement program. Okay, great. Chris, um, does the does the board does the bid board knows how the trust is actually funded? Um, why don't you why don't you share that with them? I, just a, just a quick um, comment. So the Walk of Fame ceremonies when we were scheduling them. Um, the sponsor pays those fees to the trust. The trust keeps a portion that remains with the trust and pays the chamber for production cost of the ceremony. So the money that the trust has is fully funded by the production of the Walk of Fame ceremony by the chamber. So I just, just a quick highlight. I'm just not sure that you guys know where the source of the funds are coming from, but it's important to know that the Walk of Fame ceremonies, as we're producing them, the, a big portion of it remains with the trust for repairs and I was very excited to say thank you to Jeff and to Chris and to Dan for advancing this amount of work. It's extraordinary. It's just very exciting. And we all could use some positive good news in, the, in these turbulent times. So I'm just going to say thank you for Chris and his leadership on the project management uh, stage and to the Historic Trust for advancing these repairs. So Jeff, thank you for your support of, these, of this project. Great. Thank you for the clarity on that. So uh, next we, up is the organizational statement on racial uh, equality. Bill, we've got, we had a question from Jeffrey Magavan. Oh, yeah. oh, I'm, so, yeah, I'm sorry. It was just a really, yeah. really quick question for Chris. Do you, do you guys have an estimated kind of life on these once they're, once they've been um, repaired? You know, I, I don't know. I think every circumstance might be a little bit different. Um, Rana or Dan or, or Jeff, you guys have had a lot more experience with this material. I think Terrazzo is a material that breaks down very it's easily soft, with right? the amount of the traffic that we get on the boulevard. Uh, it depends on the severity of the damage. I think once you have a crack, it deteriorates a lot faster. But Jeff has been involved with many repairs. Yeah. Jeff, when was the last time that the trust has done such a bulk repair? I think we've done small repairs from here and there. Um, you're muted, Jeff. I don't know you're talking, but we can't hear you. Here, I'm going to try to unmute him. Or probably, there you are. Okay. Um, we did, um, you know, some very big repair areas around, um, for example, at Hollywood and Highland and on the um, east side of Vine between Sunset and Hollywood um, in a couple of areas. And then we've had some construction projects that uh, like the W Hotel who've done big areas along Hollywood Boulevard and along Vine in the past. We're going back now 10, 12, 15 years for some of those. As a general rule in the ordinary wear and tear, um, which does differ on various parts of the Walk of Fame, 
Um, uh, these, the, the, when we do these and they're done, um, it, you know, you, you've got, you've got a pretty good life on them. Um, keep in mind that the, the Walk of Fame is now 50 plus years old. And um, while it did need a lot of repair, there's still a lot of parts of it that are in pretty good shape. So um, this is not, you know, we, we expect these repairs as a general rule to last a good 25, 30 years with the addition of periodic needed repairs for cracks and whatnot here and there. That's a ballpark. That's great. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Jeff, it was, my, it was my recollection that the MTA had come up with a substantial sum of money a few years ago. Am I confusing? Yeah, you? we spent we spent that on doing the areas around both metro stations. Right. That's we had that, and it, it you know we had a, an awful lot to go through with Metro uh, to to use their funds, but we we did manage to use them all. Right, that's what I remember. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Great, we'll move on. So the next item is the uh, statement of racial equity that we've been working on quite a bit. Um, I'll just leave, I'll get Chris to go on this, but I, we felt it was important that this organization have some representation here. Um, many, many other organizations and including a lot of bids on a national level are providing statements. And uh, we think we had one prepared, but we felt it was important to assure that we have a consensus from the board on it. So um, I believe it's in the package. Chris, can you take it from there? Yeah, so um, yeah, obviously it's been a challenging time for all of us, which has made us reflect on on our values um, and um, how we as, as individuals and organizations can um, really work together to address um, disparities um, that are that exist in our society by way of, of, of race or class or, or persuasion or gender. I mean, there's um, obviously discrimination and, 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 and other types of, of challenges come in many different shapes and forms. Um, but certainly the profile of, of the recent protests and marches, um, demonstrations, gatherings, vigils um, that chose Hollywood as a stage I think uh, makes us reflect on the importance of an organization like ours to ensure that we're doing what we can uh, to participate and working to correct for some of these historical inequities um, and how we can continue to evolve and create a more just uh, society. Um, and so I did work with the executive committee to, to develop a draft um, that was reflective of some of our experiences um, as a community, but also um, basically sets forth an intent to continue to evolve and to better ourselves, um, either through education or empowerment, um, but most, most importantly, by being intentional um, about diversity and doing what we can to uh, continue to ensure that we have a diversity of, of thought leaders and, and other stakeholders that um, are not only participating in this organization, but uh, that we are, we are seeking to, uh, to support through our own work. And so this statement, I think, is reflective of that intent. Um, and, um, we even we 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 discussed at length, um, you know, the the differences between just a CEO releasing a letter, and we've seen some of those. Um, you know, lots of different CEOs have, have put out their statements of support um, uh, versus the executive committee um, authoring this and putting this forward on their behalf. And we ultimately concluded that we believe that the gravity of this moment um, and the importance of this topic is um, best weighed in on by by the full board um, and um, that we wanted to make sure that any declaration of this type was one that was socialized and discussed by the board as a whole. Um, and so it would be something that we all felt um, that we would be proud to have our name beside. So uh, with that, I think the executive committee uh, recommended the statements that is in your packet. Um, I did include about a dozen or so other statements from other bids or comparable organizations uh, like the, the Department of City Planning of Britain City um, and others just to serve as some comparisons for you. Um, but uh, with that, I, I will shut up and um, I will see if there are members of the board who would like to chime in uh, or other members of the executive committee that played a role in co-authoring uh, the piece. Comments? 
again, we're looking for a consensus here so we can send this out. We really wanted to send it out in a timely manner a week ago, but we really wanted to get board input. So, um, I see anybody has a, everybody, I'm, I'm, it's a, the silence mean you're on board with us sending <laughs> it out. If not, please, this is, a, this is the time to speak up. I think Monica has her hand up. Um, I have a question. I think it's terrific that we're going to um, put out a statement um, and it's not just the typical can statement. It's really relevant to what took place in Hollywood. Um, what I'm wondering is, should should we be a little broader? So for example, point three, we're going to support Black, Indigenous, and people of color as we do with all people. You know, I, I it's almost like calling somebody else out versus including everybody in everything and being fair to everybody. I, I, I mean, I, I, I think that goes back to this whole kind of argument discussion of all people matter versus black people matter. I think that this statement is specific to people of color. It's not specific to all people. No, no, I understand. I think my, my, my point is it's not detracting from Black Lives Matter, but what it is is just adding on something. And if you don't think it is, that's fine. It's just my opinion. Hey, Monica, this is Chad. Um, I, I think that's a, a good point. And I, one of the things I want to point to was we had a call on, on Sunday and that did come up. And in the letter, I think it was discussed um, the lead up to those three bullet points was the um, the second sentence, which which was trying to be more inclusive in that, um, which was here's a way that our organization and area stakeholders can become more inclusive and support marginalized groups. It, it, that seemed to be a spot where it was put in. Um, I don't know. If, so I think there was sensitivity around that. I just wanted to share that with you. Great, thank you. I thought it was a very well-crafted statement and you know if we could turn any of this into reality and you know continue to act on the, that vision it would be great and also that's an area we could work with the chamber perhaps um so something to think about great any anybody else um i just had a quick question under number three where it says via promotion and or procurement. I don't, I don't understand what we mean by procurement. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, so that, that was basically saying that we could develop marketing programs to promote, as an example, uh, minority owned businesses. Um, uh, and or uh, we could look at our own procurement process. And we've already done this in some ways in our fiscal policies. Uh, we do provide a, a bid discount of two and a half percent um, for any uh, minority or woman-owned business that's located in the bid. Uh, it's actually five percent if you're located in the bid as well, um, which basically means that we create a preference. Um, you know, all things being equal, um, that we would create a preference uh, for supporting minority-owned businesses in that way. So, I think really what this does is it talks about how we could uh, integrate. Um, our own purchasing decisions and, and thoughts about equity um, into those. Um, and uh, we certainly don't have to stop where we are in that, in that de degree of, of procurement policy. It could go further if, if we thought it was, um, if it was important. Um, but again, this is not simply a letter, I think, for um, our organization. I think it's also meant to be sort of a call to action um, to other Hollywood-based stakeholders about some things that they could be doing as well and looking at their own procurement policies as an example. Great. Any other questions? All good questions um, and comments. Anybody else? Okay. I'll go ahead, Leslie. Unmute yourself. Oh, uh, April, can you unmute Leslie, please? Okay. I just think it's a good statement, and I particularly like the last paragraph. Fantastic. You know, Hollywood. Anybody else? Out. Okay, well, if we don't have any other comments, then I think we're going to go ahead and we'll send that out. 
But did you want to? We, we do have an action that's agendized here. If you want to, if you want to. Oh, we need an action on this. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Hang on. But we're going to need a motion. All right. Can we get a motion to approve the organizational statement of racial equity as presented? Looks like Jeffrey Mogavim has yeah, raised I'll, his hand. I'll, I'll make a motion. Jeff will make a motion. Do we have a second? Um, I did see Pogo's hand up second as a. Yes, right? please. So a all second. those in favor, could you raise your hand? <coughs> I think we got, we got everybody pretty much. Yeah, we did great. Uh, no, there's a few more here. Right. April, you got that count? Okay. Lower the hands. Anybody opposed? No. Okay. Anybody abstaining? Great. Okay. We've got that done. That's fantastic. Thank you for your support, everybody, on that. It was a lot of work, and uh, we really, really, really appreciate your support on that item. Okay. I'll move on to the uh, committee activity reports. Uh, we have a walk of fame master plan. We have Dan um, we have Dan oh, first. Yeah, walk yeah, go ahead. Thanks. I'm oh, sorry, you know, Chris. I'm working off of the printed copy you gave me um, at our meeting a few days ago, Katie, and I'm not working off the new version. So uh, I'm sorry about that. I'll get. It. I'll pull it up now. I'll I'll try to be really brief and and not bore all the committee chairs to death prior to them giving their reports. Um, I just wanted to share a few things. So the the you know as I've said before, as I've reported uh, in previous months um, since the pandemic began, we're really trying hard not to use the pandemic and now civil unrest uh, as an excuse to derail all the you know things we want to do for the Walk of Fame. So the project continues. We're in. We are now uh, full fledged in the schematic design phase, and I'm really happy about that. Um, that is going to take us. I would say at this point, probably into the at least, you know, probably into the first quarter of uh, 2021, uh, let's say, but it is moving forward and I'm working with Gensler and the consulting team on that. As that, continu as that continues to move forward, I will keep obviously keep you all posted and there will be different uh, uh, points along the way uh, for larger uh, community engagement uh, forums. I will, uh, you know, keep doing the roundtables that I've been. We've now had forty, maybe forty-one roundtables in person and virtually uh, since last fall to talk about Hollywood, and certainly since January to talk about the uh, concept plan. Um, so we're going to keep doing that, but there will be some other large uh, ways to get involved. And I'll keep everybody in the loop on that. Um, it will be interesting to see how that plays out, you know, in terms of getting people physically back together, uh, but I'll, I will be uh, sure to keep you posted. Um, in addition to that, we are actively, as I've said here before, um, trying to identify uh, and hopefully secure uh, additional resources to be able to implement things over time. So we, we, uh, there are some uh, county, state, and now federal uh, dollars that are available. The federal dollars have actually been made available through the CARES Act, uh, specifically for uh, communities uh, that have been impacted by COVID-19, and ideally for projects that align with the Economic Development Administration's current investment priorities. And some of those investment priorities uh, have to do with, you know, is the project in an opportunity zone? Is there some kind of like regional or international connectivity? Uh, does it demonstrate, you know, like economic or workforce development, uh, critical infrastructure, stuff like that? So um, the city felt uh, that the Walk of Fame Master Plan was a very strong candidate for all of those reasons. Does not guarantee us anything, but that's another uh, application that we've begun work on. So hopefully uh, we get some money from some different places. While we're doing that, uh, I am also uh, talking to uh, different departments, uh, especially the Department of Transportation. Uh, and Chris and I have had a lot of really good uh, conversations, Rana and I as well, about things that we can uh, tinker with, pilot, try out, uh, whatever you wanna call it over time 
to sort of prepare uh, the community, move the community in the direction of ultimately fulfilling some of those big goals of the master plan, like more space for people, more space for things like sidewalk dining. Um, so we, uh, I will keep you all posted. We're working on like, you know, putting in bike share stations. It's gotten a little derailed because of the, uh, all the things that are going on, but at some point relatively soon, we're gonna have bike share. We're gonna have some additional wayfinding signage for vehicles for our public parking garages. The good news on those, kind, on those wayfinding signs is uh, the Department of Transportation uh, will fully be the entity uh, in control of uh, things like that. Um, so that's pretty much it on the Walk of Fame. Uh, I am, thank you to Rana, going to be giving a uh, presentation on July 8th um, as part of the uh, Chambers Town Hall, virtual town hall series that they're doing. So hope to have uh, even some more information at that time. Uh, but I just wanted to give you that update and I'm happy to take any questions. Questions, on the, this excited, I'm so excited about this plan. Questions? And thank you, Bill. Yeah, you know, I'll say if there aren't any questions, Bill and I sat down for lunch, I think in January, which feels like it was about 700 years ago. And I think at the last in-person board meeting that I was at, you know, uh, Drew had a really good question about, you know, different funding sources. And so, you know, as long as I'm here in this role and we're around, you have my commitment to find more money uh, for this, keep adding to the resources that we have and to just keep pushing it forward, so. Got it. Thank you, really appreciate yeah. that. I thought David Green might speak up because the Pantasia might just announce he was funding the whole program right now, but I guess he's holding off. D David and I have been speaking about that. That will come at next <laughs> month. That was my joke of the day, David. We'll have to remember to take him off a of mute next time so he can share that good news. I, I, I want to thank Rana and Dan for promoting the Pantages. You're creating lots of business. Unfortunately, nobody can come visit. <laughs> okay, great. Any other questions for Dan? We're good? All right, we'll move on to the uh, committee report now, now that I have the updated agenda. Thank you. Um, we'll start, is Frank on the phone? Yep. He is. Um, yeah, there he is. Hi, Frank. How you doing? Um, good to see everybody. Uh, you know, I, I want, there's a couple items on, on today's agenda for our committee that I think are going to um, spur some healthy discussion and reporting. So we'll, we'll jump to those and focus on those two. I will just say from a committee standpoint on overall reporting, not surprising with, to me, May represents a little bit of a rebirthing after um, April being the, the totally sort of shelter in place or safe at home. There's some activity starting to take place and um, our proactive engagements and calls for service are slightly up from April. So are volumes in trash cans and different things like that. Uh, it's what you would expect. Um, May doesn't represent uh, any numbers as a result of the protests uh, and everything else going on. It's really a June event and I'm sure we'll see some, some things there. And um, I will say that um, our cleaning and, and, and safe crew out there on the street were really our eyes and ears uh, in many ways, uh, supplemented Chris's, you know, every morning reporting. And uh, we're, we're really grateful to have that crew um, be out there and, and uh, be our sort of conduit of information. The two items I'd like to discuss, um, and I'd like to take them in this order. Uh, one is just a report from Ruben on uh, the, any property damage overall um, and, and give us a little bit of a lay of the land on some of the unfortunate looting and uh, crimes committed, uh, you know, using the protests as an opportunity for distraction. And then the second one after Ruben's done with his update that I'd like to discuss and give a little bit of a prelude to before Chris comes in and, and gives us a lot of detail is uh, the armed security. So Ruben, you wanna jump in? Sure. Let me share a screen. All right. So last week, uh, Chris tasked me with uh, getting our safety team to do a quick inventory or do some business contacts with our properties that are actually open right now. 
So this is a report that uh, we've done uh, as of yesterday. It's been up updated as of yesterday. And uh, this is going to be something that's ongoing because as you're aware, there's still a lot of property that are still boarded up. So definitely these are the properties that we've been able to be in contact with in regards to their status. So a quick introduction, you know, the safety team canvassed the district the last seven days and conducted their business contacts with those that were actually open. Uh, the purpose was to find out if property was damaged during the protest and or looting. So total number of properties that we were able to be get, get in contact with were 252. And of those 252 properties, 69 confirmed they had some sort of damage. In regards to location, as you can imagine, Hollywood Boulevard was pretty uh, busy in regards to that type of property damage with 25. Uh, Sunset Boulevard had 19 separate properties that uh, had damage. Vine Street had 11, Poenga had nine, and then Selma, Yucca, and Ivar had three, and uh, the last two had one. So when we talk about type of instances, uh, graffiti, uh, we had 27 different properties that suffered from graffiti. Now keep in mind, this is, if, this is when the property owners or property managers actually reported or they saw they had graffiti. Every single day, our Clean, uh, clean Street team was out there removing the graffiti as early as they possibly could along with the LA beautification team who helped us out and volunteered with us to help us remove the graffiti. So 27 occasions, uh, property managers or owners were aware they had graffiti on their building. In regards to theft and looting, 28 different occasions where a uh, property or business had theft or looting that reported to us. In regards to damages to windows and gates, whether the windows were busted, they were uh, set, uh, uh, tagged on, they were damaged to the point they have to be removed and replaced. We had 49 different occasions where a property had that instance. We're still, again, we're still waiting for those stores or properties to open up again, remove their boards, so we can better assess uh, that type of damage. And also when we talk about incident correlation, you know, of the 69 businesses, uh, this chart reflects if they suffered one, two, or all three crimes that I just highlighted uh, on their property. So in regards to the one occasion or one instance, 38 times that occurred, regards to two or more, or actually two, 27 instances, and then three, uh, four instances where they have received all three uh, crimes that were committed against their property, whether it's graffiti, uh, looting and theft, and the damage to property in regards to broken glass or broken front uh, doors. Again, this is just a quick update uh, where this is gonna be ongoing uh, this coming week. We're gonna keep this going until things get back to normal, and hopefully next month we'll have another update in regards to an overall assessment of damage in our in our district. Any questions, concerns? No? Okay. Thank you, Frank. Okay. Um, so we'll we'll shift to the topic of farm security. And uh, I will say that Chris and I um, had started talking about whether our, we should have armed guards on the street, which we currently do. Is it about 25% of our guards, Chris? That's about right, yeah. So roughly 25% of our guards right now in the bid security are armed. And uh, we had talked about a few instances uh, where they had been confronted with different individuals. We had talked about some of the more recent instances where a weapon might have been drawn by one of our guards and we were really having the conversation as to, and, and sort of, I, I feel like it's somewhat connected to, you know, a lot of the work we've done over the last nine months or so with ambassador program and talking about how Santa Monica does it. And there's just a different non-controversial uh, approach to dealing with the people on the street. And we started talking about whether we should still have armed guards in Hollywood. And uh, honestly, uh, I'll be, you know, through the conversation, I oscillated back and forth with this one. Um, I've been on the board um, well over a decade at this point, and, and I, I know many of the stories in the past, and I know some of the reasons why we had them. I also know that there's a, a movement to a better way. And, uh, you know, we've all seen in our, uh, the newsletters that Dan Halden sends out, um, some of the movement LA has taken now to unarmed uh, responses to non-emergency events. Uh, in lieu of police officers. So there's a real conversation to have here. And the, our, our committee, the place management committee, um, is going to make a decision on this, whether to keep the armed guards or not. 
And we felt that we wanted to have a fruitful conversation with the overall board prior to making that decision. So we didn't make it in a, in a vacuum. And we wanted to have uh, board members have an opportunity to weigh in. But I, I will tell you, uh, anyone who knows Chris knows that he is in love with statistics. So he's going to share some with us. Uh, you know, he, he's recently told me that he's even done his research on how many, how many bids in North America out of the 2,500 bids in North America have armed guards and it's four. Okay. So it's, it's really an interesting t statistic um, in, in relation to the concerns a lot of people have um, on how we confront situations. I think this is a conversation we wanted to do with the larger board. So Chris, I'll, I'll hand it over to you um, to share a little bit of why this was a current concern um, of ours even before the events of George Floyd. And uh, you know, you could share statistics and then I just wanna open it up. I, I, you know, I want people to chime in. All right, thank you very much, Frank. And um, I will say that um, after having this conversation with our executive committee, they did ask me to sort of put all the data together, put it all in one place, and let's let's understand this whole context together. Um, and and you know this you know as Frank mentioned, this is something that I saw my first day um, ta after taking this job and scratched my head and wondered why are we doing it this way? Um, because in my 20 year career of of, of in, in urban place management, working in both coasts um, and, and Michigan, um, I've, I'd never seen it this way before. Um, and so it was, it was an anomaly to me. Um, and so as a part of this is, is, is conducting some research, I worked, reached out to the International Downtown Association. Um, their CEO basically told me the only one that we're aware of um, is you guys. Um, and so Hollywood was, was pretty unique. Um, also reached out to uh, Block by Block, which administers clean and safe programs in about 125 cities in the U.S. Um, and they were they were helpful in identifying, based on their experience in operating these programs, both in communities where they have contracts or ones that they might not have won the bids, um, you know, where they have seen any of this. Um, and so Ruben and I have been working on ironing out this data. Um, and, and come back with uh, basically only five known bids with, with armed security out of the universe of, of bids um, in, in North America. Um, and so that's roughly two one thousandths of a percent um, or about one out of every 500. Um, the other uh, bids that, um, that we can confirm um, are, are Portland, Oregon has some armed officers um, their bid's a little different. Um, I think it's ma managed by their Chamber of Commerce, um, and the city actually disbanded their bid about 10 years ago. Um, Houston, Texas, um, you know, an open carry state, um, also has um, armed uh, security. Um, and then uh, Ruben was able to find a small little district outside of Sacramento. It's not their downtown area, but it's, it's, um, it's called the 80 Watts District. It's a small 10 block area. Uh, that doesn't seem to have a lot of uh, police force, uh, and they they also have armed uh, uh, security. Uh, and then we've heard of one, which is in an entertainment district outside of downtown Dallas, a little place called Deep Ellum, if you've ever been there. Um, it's a cool little honky-tonk area, uh, real popular with bars and nightclubs. It's an entertainment district, so by day it's dead, uh, but by night um, there is a, a, a real big uh, bar scene. Um, that's the other one that we're able uh, to confirm. Um, in terms of LA, um, for those of you who don't know, we've got 40 bids in the city of Los Angeles. There's a map on the right, um, just to remind you how big the city of LA is. Um, and then there's lots of other bids in the LA region, including West, West Hollywood, Santa Monica, Pasadena's got a couple, Burbank, uh, Long Beach has a couple. Uh, we are the only bid um, in the Los Angeles area uh, to have armed security, and there is only one other um, in California. Um, so just to give you an overview, um, our budget for safety and security is, is uh, just north of $3 million. Um, our average week, we're spending about $55,500 um, on, um, on security, um, and that totals up to be about 1,400 hours, and that is everything from our director down to our dispatcher, um, including all of uh, the hours on the street. 
the percentage of the cost that we spend weekly is um, about is just over 50 percent. Um, and the percentage of hours um, is just under 40 percent. And as you can imagine, uh, the licensing and other types of qualifications involved in being able to uh, equip an individual with with a weapon um, it also results in higher cost. Um, so the average hour for an armed officer that we pay is about uh, twice as much as what we spend on an unarmed officer. Um, so annually, what we spend on our armed patrol is just over a million and a half dollars. Um, and if you're curious about uh, the other hours uh, that are worked per week within the security program, you can uh, you can see those um, below in the final bullet. Um, so in total, what is what do our armed guards do? Um, I would say that generally speaking, we have trained our storefront businesses to call us instead of LAPD uh, to deal with minor issues. And the first one on that list is trespassing. Uh, we, are, we are usually the first call for when there is somebody in their business that they don't want to be there. Um, they usually call us first. Um, and so those account for about 68% of all calls. Um, and then disturbances, which is essentially like a trespassing case, but it's one that happens in the public realm. And it's an, an individual that is demonstrating uh, worrisome behavior um, and we'll get called to deal with that. Oftentimes a, an individual suffering from a mental illness as an example. Um, okay, so other, um, there have been instances where we have responded to occasions of theft um, as well as things like vandalism in progress. Uh, but generally speaking, we get about 125 calls a week um, and about 18 calls a day. Um, and when you look at uh, the investment in the armed uh, patrols, um, the uh, cost uh, averages out to be just about $230 uh, to respond to each individual call. Uh, so just a couple more slides just for data. Um, and so one of the things that we've been doing is uh, better understanding who calls us and how often they call us. Um, and 28 uh, storefront businesses, and we have about 550 in the full bid, um, 28 of them uh, represent over half of all of the calls uh, that we have gotten in 2020. Um, and when you look at just the top 10, um, they, they constitute about a third of all of our calls. Um, which then uh, equates to a cost, and that's just a direct cost of about a half million dollars a year that we respond that we spend responding to trespassing calls by those top ten businesses. Um, and then, lastly, um, one of the reasons why I brought this, uh, I think, to Frank in, to start the conversation is um, I am concerned about um, the public relations impact that it has to this organization. Um, if you start to go on YouTube and look at um, images and videos of our of our bid patrol, um, it it is it's it is con concerning. Um, and uh, in this day and age where everything is on video um, and oftentimes from multiple angles, um, I think it's only a matter of time before a video of one of our officers pulling a weapon is uh, circulated, um, which would really affect I think the image of this organization. Um, God forbid ever discharging a round, um, I think would start to create a, um, a, a degree of liability that is also very concerning. Um, and then it comes at a very significant monetary cost, right? And this, this is not a conversation that started about cost, but I think cost is a variable that should be discussed. Um, and um, we spend a lot to pull people out of, of businesses. And there's very infrequently any legal action that is actually taken, right? So we're sometimes responding to the same individual multiple times a day who just moves from one business to the next. Um, and so whether or not there's a lack of desire to prosecute them, um, you know, once they get turned over or there is, um, you know, other types of, of, of challenges and, and whether or not there's somebody who's willing to press charges, um, we do our find ourselves spending a lot of time and resource um, responding to a very small number of instances uh, when looked at in the grand scheme of things. Um, and then again, like this conversation started before uh, this moment or this wave of change was, uh, was unfolding. And just today we saw um, our own police chief of the city of LA 
um, you know, support um, this new movement um, to reprioritize those nonviolent calls um, to something other than PD. You know, so I do think it begs uh, the, the need for discussion uh, amongst the board about sort of how we got to where we are um, and sort of the, the, the organization that we want to be, the, the role that we see ourselves playing in this space. Um, we, we definitely dedicate a lot of resource, um, you know, at, at million and a half, that is um, more than goals two, three, and four combined um, that, that we spend um, on this area. Um, and I think it, it sort of begs a discussion more broadly about uh, the role and purpose of our safety and security program um, and how we can be uh, basically utilize our stakeholders money to be the most effective of being able to create a safe Hollywood. So uh, Mr. Chair, I will turn it back over to you um, to solicit any feedback from members of the board. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like um, to add just a couple yeah, of closing we, real quick. Go, go ahead. ahead, Frank, please. Okay, yeah, just a couple of closing things. Um, one, uh, Chris and I arranged a call, Chris, myself and Ruben arranged a call with uh, Captain Laurie, Captain of Hollywood, to um, just brainstorm with him and talk about this with him. And, and not surprisingly, he, he's not going to direct us one way or the other what to do with our armed or unarmed security people, um, because he doesn't want to take the responsibility of, of being on the hook for that directive. That being said, um, you know, he was pretty clear that uh, having armed security is not at his request. Okay? If, if, if we didn't have them, he wouldn't be asking us to get them. And if we didn't have them, uh, you know, he, he wouldn't, if, if, we, if we do have them, um, it's not because he's asking us to have them. The other thing I wanted to mention was um, just a point that probably will, after we have this discussion on armed versus unarmed security, this 25%, there's a statistic in Chris's details that 5% of the storefronts are responsible for more than 50% of our service calls. When you go through these exercises and you and you start to hone in on those types of details, that's clearly as the place management committee something we have to look at closer. That is just there that we have to really look at if if we're doing something inefficiently. There there might be a different process we have to take or a different approach with that. And then the the last thing I just wanted to say as far as cost, yeah, Chris, I mean you know the the cost is definitely a factor, and I appreciate you highlighting it. And it's, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, half a million plus or whatever with the armed security because we have them. But what I want to make sure when the board thinks about this today, you know, even though that cost could be saved or could be used for something else, it's opportunity cost to be used for something else. I, I don't want this decision of armed or unarmed to be based on cost. I want to know what people think as far as from a safety position or, you know, keeping our streets in the way we want. Do we want armed or unarmed? So I just don't want it to be a cost heavy discussion. That's all. Frank, thank you for those comments. I'm gonna open the, this is a pretty important topic uh, and it's timely for us to make some decisions on. So I'm gonna open the floor up for comments um, right now. So raise your hand or wave or something into the camera or or do a little, or, oh yeah, I'll go ahead and do the raise the hands. Right, so with, three people, we got oh, Brian, Jeff and Michael. Yeah, um, Jeff, go ahead. Why don't you go first? Yeah. Sure. So, I guess um, my first question would be, and it, it it it's a little bit related to cost, but not. It's it's not uh, the the reason I'm asking the question. I would just want to know, it, have you, if the committee does move forward with that decision, has it been decided that you would allocate those costs towards unarmed? Um, guards, so we would have a much more significant presence in terms of bodies, but they would they would be unarmed. That was that was one question I had, and then my my second question is: Do we have any data or idea how often these armed, armed guards have had to to draw their weapons? Those are my two well, questions. You know, good good questions, Chris. I'll let you uh, respond, but I do want to say that I think how any savings would be allocated is a discussion we'd have at the committee level and possibly come back to the board and discuss, but clearly our budgets are set and that money is there to be spent to further supplement 
the street presence with unarmed uh, security people if we so choose. Um, or it might be there's such a savings with unarmed personnel that we could have the same number of bodies or a little bit more and still have a surplus to use on something else that, that we need money for. And then Chris, I know that you have a few instances in recent weeks or months where they've drawn their weapon that you could talk about. Yeah, I, 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 and I would actually prefer just to hand it over to Ruben. Um, I think he's off mute. Um, just off the top of your head, the, the number of instances where we've um, had to withdraw the weapon um, in the last couple of months or maybe in the last year. I'm aware of uh, three different occasions uh, where I was notified of our armed staff removing their weapons uh, during that incident. And, th and that's since you've started? Yes, since I started uh, late September, early October. Yeah. Yes, over the last nine months. Yeah. All right, I'll go to Brian. Could you unmute Brian, please? Go ahead, Brian. Thank you. Um, I, I've been involved for a long time also um, on the Sunset Bid Board, and um, I have always made a, a voice of concern about armed security and the cost. I mean, that, 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 that was a concern of mine and the liability issue of that. I wasn't aware of the statistics that, uh, that Chris presented today, which is quite uh, interesting to know uh, that most bids uh, are not involved with armed security. Um, that being said, um, I know uh, a few years back when we were concerned about active shooter issues um, uh, that were happening all over the country. And we did have one here in Hollywood um, at Sunset and Vine where our bid security was involved. And they actually did, I think, uh, by having weapons uh, help to uh, uh, manage that situation uh, until the police could get there. And that was pretty dramatic. Um, I don't know for sure that they saved lives, but um, in that particular situation, um, there was uh, a, a, a need for something like that. Um, uh, I, I don't know what the situation's going to be going forward with our LAPD. I know their uh, and 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 uh, their their uh, weapons types of situations and what they'll have access to. But that being said, I I I don't feel that it's um, that that our bid security should be carrying should be armed. Um, I just don't think that's that's our place um, in this community. I think we have to rely on the uh, on the police for that. Uh, that's that's the extent of my comment. Okay, um, I believe that um, Michael, you had a couple comments. Could you go next, please? Yeah, um, I, I attended a TDOZ meeting a while back where the police officer came and basically gave a report on. I was a little surprised on how many guns were removed from Hollywood Boulevard. It was something like thirty or forty last year. And that kind of scared me just seeing like I didn't realize there are that many guns on the boulevard that they removed the police, the LAPD did. I also wanted to note that I think the LAPD or Hollywood division regarding the um, the riots and the, the protests did an amazing job, uh, especially our division compared to Santa Monica and Beverly Hills. And as far as the damage was definitely li much more limited. And I was a little upset to see Garcetti just kind of cut their funding for something that, you know, basically something happened somewhere else and LAPD has to be, have their funding cut. So I wasn't happy about that. And I, as far as us having armed guards, I could see the liability issue, but my also worry is what, what's going to happen now that, you know, LAPD is going to have their funding cut. I mean, are we right now? I trust the LAPD in our area, uh, but am I going to trust them going forward? I don't know because everybody seems to be going towards, oh, let's get rid of the police. So um, that's what that's my concern. Good point. Um, Chad? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, um, so it really, really might help seeing the data. data. Yeah. Oh, you're having an audio problem there. Hang on a second. Oh, no, can, you can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Is it me or is it everybody else? They spit garbage. It's, oh, it's a, it. Very, I uh, well, yeah, 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 I'll just pass that now. Okay. Hang on a minute. Um, Katie? Um, you're unmuted, Katie. Go ahead. Thanks, Bill. Um, this is such a great uh, and healthy discussion to have, and I um, really appreciate, Chris, the um, presentation you pulled together with all the statistics. It's really helpful to just frame this in its um, best context. Um, one question, and it kind of piggybacks um, on what Brian Fulb was saying about the incident that happened on Sunset with the active shooter, um, and maybe this is better suited for LAPD, but is there um, any data on when our armed versus unarmed security um, did respond to such incidents and did help diffuse the situation until L LAPD was um, able to get to the scene? Um, do we have any, um, any statistics or data on that? Is that a question for me, Katie? For anyone who's able to, yeah, answer. If anyone from LAPD is on or you. Um, I think I, we do I, have yeah. two members of LAPD that are on. Um, I certainly can't answer that question. Um, let's see if they remain on the call. Yeah. I'm just curious. Can you uh, hear me? It's Sar Sergeant Neil Wank. Uh, hey, Nate. Yeah, that's there's Sergeant Wank. Great. So uh, to, to answer Katie's question, at this moment, I don't have any quantifiable data to point to how many times a security team from the bid either got there first or took control of the situation or semi-control of the situation uh, until uniformed police show up. So that would be a little bit difficult to research. We'd have to uh, uh, be able to capture more data uh, on our calls. Um, but what, what year was that active shooter at Sunset and Vine? I can probably do some research on it if I knew around when it was uh um, it was 2009 okay so yeah so that was uh that was quite some time ago um and was probably the impetus for when uh the team that polices your entertainment district was formed by then uh captain uh, v gromala who's now an assistant chief uh so the hollywood entertainment district team that i am tasked with uh, leading and managing was came into effect in 2009 um, but I can do some research on that incident if you'd like me to. Um, but as far as quantifying the calm that security brings to situations prior to PD arrival, that's kind of hard to, to, uh, research. Okay. Thank you. Um, David, you had a question or a comment. Yeah, I actually have two, uh, first of all, Regarding the um, armed security, I mean, I, I guess I go with Frank. I, you know, I'm going back and forth on that, but I think based on you know today's environment, I think we we have to you know move towards a totally unarmed force. Uh, so that that's just my opinion on that. But I have a, a bigger issue with the uh, <laughs> ten businesses that take up that percentage of our uh, call and status. I mean, I'm, I mean, Frank, what, what are we gonna, what's the process or what are we gonna do to kind of address that? Because it seems like we're giving private security to 10 people uh, so they don't have to have private security. I, I think, I think um, we've taken the first important step, which is realizing it's taken place. Yeah, and, okay, great. But I mean, I mean, you're gonna look into it, right? And now, and now we've got to dive in and really understand that better and I think something there has to change. Okay, great. Okay, that's all I have. If, if I could add one thing to that, if it's all right, uh, today's question is, to me, it's about form and function, right? And, you know, it's a classic debate in design, right? And as we think about designing this program or any of our programs, I think we have to ask ourselves, what function do we want it to provide? Like, why does it exist? What do we want it to do? What are its goals? And then you work from that to build the actual form of the program, which would include the decision to arm or not arm, you know, th these individuals. 
right? And it all gets back to the nature of the request and the nature of the functionality of the program and really where we want them um, you know, to prioritize their efforts um, and then how we promote and essentially advertise those efforts. Okay. Um, Chris, if I may, uh, start Neil Wank one more time. I'm sorry. If I, if I may, uh, Sergeant Neil Wank from uh, LAPD one more time uh, about that top 10 location. Sure. Uh, that, that would be the information that we would like to have uh, and receive on either a weekly or a monthly basis whenever the statistics are compiled. We have that uh, uh, walking footbeat that is a seven day coverage and there's nothing better for a walking footbeat to do than to be directed to those locations where they are needed the most. So if they're if today's the first step in identifying those locations, my simple request would be from the LAPD in Hollywood would be to be supplied with that information so that we can properly direct and address those top 10 locations and, and move them down the chain. Great idea. Great and idea. we do, Sergeant, we do, we do provide that top 10 at every um, place management meeting. So we do that calculation and we can make sure that we um, we email that presentation over to yourself and the other officers that are assigned to Hollywood. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that point. Larry? Uh, yeah. Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. So um, first, I'd like to just impart a uh, uh, happening for Monday morning. Um, then I'd like to sort of give my opinion of this because this is obviously a pretty, pretty heavy topic and discussion and meaningful one that we're having right now. And third, I'd just like to ask a question. Um, but first, Monday morning, I woke up uh, to find out that Argyle House had been shot with a pellet gun. Um, a homeless man was shooting people in the street across uh, Argyle Avenue from the property, and one of the stray pellets hit our building. So the, da the damage wasn't bad. It shattered a glass. We cleaned it up already. But obviously, that caused a lot of concern among my staff. So I was immediately in my car over there to sort of calm people down, right? Um, my staff did call the bid security and they did not show up. Uh, we called the LAPD and they were there immediately and disarmed the situation. So, you know, that's just sort of gives you context of the way of an experience of mine that, that kind of happened this, just earlier this week, so Monday morning. Um, secondly, I, I tend to trust the police despite all the horrible stuff we're seeing in the media. Um, but really, my belief is that armed protection is should be left to the cops. Uh, I, I feel like having armed guards on behalf of an institution such as the bid is almost like a vigilanteism that, that is concerning to me. Um, and, and finally, I, I just want to know if if one of these guys actually discharged their weapon in the public right of way, like what happens after that? That's my comment. Yeah. I think Drew has a question. Yeah, Drew. Uh, I, I look at this, uh, I think you have to look at this question, or at least I, I look at this question uh, in, in a sort of historical reference, meaning there's a time and a place, arguably there's a time and a place for everything. And I think that, you know, I've been involved with the bid for a long time and, and Hollywood for a, a long time. And, I, and I, I would make the argument that perhaps it, it, there was a time that it may have been more appropriate for a bid to, to um, be armed, uh, rather bid uh, security to, to be armed. But I, I, I also think we have to look at the here, the now and the present and a number of things have changed. Number one, I would say that the presence and the effectiveness of LAPD is, is greater, is, is very different and more robust than it has been in years past, number one. Uh, number two, the area has changed very, very dramatically, number two. And I, I think that you, you, I don't believe that you can ignore where we are as a society and culturally. I, I, I think that um, was Larry who said something like vigilanteism. I, I don't know if that's the case, but it's, it really, it really, it's, I find it a little bit unnerving. And, and by the way, I don't have any issues with guns, uh, uh, but I, I find it unnerving that our, our bid security is, 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 uh, is carrying a gun in, in today's era. You know, we can argue that, it, as I said, that at some point in time, 
earlier on, it may have been appropriate. It was a, it was a much rougher area 20 years ago, 15 years ago than it is today. So from, from my historical sort of argument, I think we've evolved past that. That's just my opinion. And that's all it is. But that's sort of how I, I think we're beyond that. I think, I think PD, um, as, as Larry said, I think PD is, is good at what they do and, and you should leave gun carrying matters to trained professionals who do it every day, day in and day out for a living, right? Very good point. Thank you, Drew. Yeah. Um, who else, Mark? Um, who else do we have there? You got Monica on there. Monica, yeah, Monica, go ahead. Could you unmute Monica? Um, Monica, are you there? Can you hear me? Now we can. Okay, sorry. I was I was just wondering, and it's not for my comment. Mike Harkins was saying, can you hear me? And I said, no, and he doesn't know how to get on. I just wanted to say that. I said, okay. let me tell them for you. Oh, okay. Let me unmute Mike. Let's see if I can find him. Mike, you're unmuted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, there's a really bad echo though. Yeah, you probably have your phone and if you have your phone and computer running simultaneously, that's why you get the feedback. Okay. It's gotta be one or the other. You want to try them again? Try Mike again, please. Yeah. Hey, wonder, can you unmute him? He's uh, dropped oh, off. Yeah, he's in the waiting room here. Okay. Uh, um, while we're waiting back for him, Brian had a comment. How about now? There you go. Oh, there you go. Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry about that, guys. So, um, yeah, I come from a little bit of a different perspective, but I'm glad to hear that this is going to, this is going to come back to the committee because um, I have some information and data as well that I can share with uh, the committee at the proper time. But um, just overall, I mean, one of the things I'd like to ask uh, LAPD and the bid is um, I think currently um, LAPD's response time to a 911 call is about seven minutes. That's a long time. Um, if we're going to defund the police to some degree, that's going to increase not only for 911 calls, but for regular calls. So what do we lose in response times with our armed personnel um, on high priority calls that LAPD just can't get to? Um, so, you know, that might be uh, something to look at um, since we can't go back to the um, you know, the, the, the bid holding somebody and waiting for LAPD's response time. I, I don't think we're gonna get that data appropriately at the end of the day, but um, we can certainly get LAPD's response times, how that uh, will be affected. And I think uh, Ruben, if I'm correct, we have the, the bids response times to some of these calls. Um, yeah, yes, I do. I, I can do some more research in regards to the response times through Stack FM. And I could provide that data probably at our next goal one meeting if okay. you want to request that. Okay. Another, just the other thing real quick that I'll throw out is, you know, I, I heard conversations about the, the, the bid officers and drawing their weapons three or four times within a year's period. Um, that's not a problem if it's legitimate. So I'm unaware of any problem with a bid officer doing that inappropriately. And if we had the specifics on that, I'd be happy to go over it, address it. And I'd like to hear about them actually. Um, because just throwing out a, a, a generic, they drew their guns. Well, why did they draw them? What were the circumstances? What happened? Um, so those are important things to find out and understand before we make such a big decision. Um, and then just speaking for this, this side of Hollywood on this particular block, I can assure you that I don't think there's one property owner that would support um, losing the armed personnel. But um, that's for a different day. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I'm going to go back over to um, uh, Chase. 
Thanks. Um, just one quick thought too is outside of the the effectiveness uh, of armed guards, it, it's also the port important to keep in mind the perception of safety. And I, I don't have anything handy. I, I didn't know we'd be wading into this, but I, I know I've read in the past, you know, from, from psychologists and, and uh, criminologists and sociologists that in a, a lot of situations, um, you know, whether that be social service centers or schools, there, there is actually the opposite effect of having armed guards. It, it does not put uh, your average person at ease. It, it creates kind of a, a, a heightened awareness and a sense of fear. So there's that aspect to kind of consider as well. Um, that's all. Thank you. Um, Brian? Thanks, Bill. I, I also wanted to, um, I, I know this isn't really part of the topic of discussion with respect to uh, whether or not we want to continue with armed security, but um, I, I was involved with the uh, uh, getting a lot of the feedback with regard to the ambassador program, which we are implementing. And when we do have a discussion about armed versus unarmed, um, I think the ambassador uh, aspect of that needs to, needs to come into the discussion, whether uh, some of that, if we do uh, decide to eliminate the armed, would get shifted more on the ambassador side than necessarily the unarmed uh, security guard side. Um, the, and the reason that I, that I bring that up is a lot of the uh, feedback that we got from the other bids when we went to go visit was that the ambassador program gave people uh, a feeling of comfort um, that, uh, and this is uh, tagging onto what Chase was saying, gave people a sense of, uh, of comfort um, and they were able to diffuse some situations um, before it became heightened um, and the need to even call the police so, uh, just because they weren't uh, looking like police officers. Um, so it's, it, it's something to think about what the perception is of people and how they react to people in uniforms uh, or military type or police type of uniforms. Um, these are things that we need to think about as well. That was, that was my comment. Thank you. Um, Chase, did you have another comment? Your hand's off, Ken. Yeah, just one more thing I remembered. Um, it may be worth, as this conversation evolves, uh, reaching out to Carrie Morrison, um, as she's been you know, working with, with her new program. Um, she and I discussed, this is months, maybe a year ago, um, and, and the presence of unarmed guards was, was kind of an important tenet of their philosophy in, in making people um, feel safe. So, you know, her, her insight there um, may be valuable. She's, she's done a lot of looking into that, so. Great. Okay, so I guess that's it. No, I don't see any other comments from anybody else. This has been a good, solid conversation. Um, my position on it is all about risk. Um, in the current environment we're in, um, if we had an incident, all the work we've done for all these years now as the Hollywood Partnership would be really, really devastated if we had an incident. And so every day that goes by that we have people with guns, if something goes wrong, because it, it it's human nature, something, something will eventually, um, the partner people are going to start saying, why on earth is this bid? maybe the only bid in the United States of America has armed guards in Hollywood. And I, I just think that from the point of view as being the chair, my job is to make sure that we're doing all the right things and we're trying to avert risk and making sure that we're, we're, we're doing the right thing to represent uh, the property owners, which is primary. And then we also, rep we also represent the community as a whole. So I think um, I am, again, I am a significant advocate of not having armed, unarmed force. With that said, I guess what I want to ask this board of directors is, is it an action you want to take back to Frank's committee and have them vet it some more and go another month? Is it something we can make a decision on today? Um, I, I don't want to, you know, don't want to, I don't want to rush it, but at the same time, it is a timely issue. So um, 
Uh, any any thoughts in terms of that, Frank? Why don't I come back to you on that, please? Yeah, I think you know, I I think the intention was to come back. Yeah. Okay. Um, to the committee and allow the committee to have a, a robust discussion on it. Great. Let's let's do that then. And again, if anybody else on the board, because this is an important topic, wants to give feedback to Frank and, or a member of the committee, please do so. But I, I do urge the committee to move forward rapidly with a decision to bring back to the board. Yeah, and when you know people are welcome to come to our next committee meeting if they wanted to. Great. Okay, that was a long, a good top. Very, I knew it was gonna be long. That one's a big topic. I appreciate everybody's input on it. Thank you, uh, Frank. Are there other uh, are there other items on oh, your uh, agenda for goal one? We're good to move on. Great. Let's go to goal two, Chase. Thank you. Um, so our committee met on Tuesday, June 9th, and a uh, couple of updates should be fairly quick, and I'll, I'll kick it over to Rich shortly here um, for a little presentation. But uh, the tree trimming scope of work is underwear, underway and should be completed by the month's end. Uh, probably would have been done already, but uh, adorably we have some nesting birds in some of the trees and so they were not trimmed. Um, the, com once completed, the, the total scope will include 410 trees throughout the bid trim. That's 245 palms, 75 jacarandas, 79 ficus and 11 Chinese elm trees. Uh, so keep your eyes to the sky that that should be completed in the next couple of weeks here. And then uh, next we have the set the scene program. Uh, if you recall, that is uh, the bids grant program where we have approximately $20,000 in funds set aside to to help uh, enable some of our community partners to create public art projects. Um, I'm going to hand it to Rich. He can kind of walk through uh, the four applicants that we interviewed over the past uh, two weeks. And um, then I'll give you an update from there. Hi, everyone. All right, so uh, really quick here, because we're running short on time. Uh, as you know, this has been months long in the making and we have uh, filed it down to four of the projects that will be moving forward. Uh, the first two are moving forward with funding and those are, oh, hold on, there we go. Okay, so um, Arts Bridging the Gap, who did the murals along the boarded up uh, windows a couple weeks ago at Hollywood and Vine area. They will be doing a mural on the stretch of newsstands at 1655 North Las Palmas, just south of that 7-Eleven, pictured here up at the top. So we are going to take those dilapidated roll downs and use a local, the local black artist, Noah Humes. Uh, this is one of his expansive murals here. He is very excited for this, and this is going to be a community building themed mural. Uh, that will be with Hollywood Pal, Arts Bridging the Gap, LAPD, and LA County Arts in the mix for that. Um, this next one is the Hollywood Vinyl District Lighted Banner Poles Project, which will be along 10 street light poles from on Selma from Schrader to Vine. They are pictured here, and a better graphic is this. Um, this is the Hollywood Vinyl District with Hollywood Media Center and Relevant Group that will be spearheading that. Uh, additionally, this is a uh, large mural that is a chalkboard with neon lights at the top of it that spell out Hollywood 15 minutes of fame. Um, this is contingent on the property owner uh, sign off for the project as it is the back of the library building. So we are working with Elvina Beck of the Central Hollywood Neighborhood Council and Podshare to make this happen uh, where the community can jump in and, you know, draw chalk uh, their artwork as well as their thoughts. And there will be string lights strung above the Cosmo Street area right here. This will be a great community access point. It involves the farmer's market on Sundays and could really enhance the general area. Fourthly, we have a This Little Light of Mine mural. Artist Jennifer Corson, who has these uh, anatomical hearts throughout the city of Los Angeles and murals. This one is in Pershing Square. This one was down at one of the Metro stops. She's a well-known artist in the area. She will be doing one that is this little light of mine themed and will be another community 
active mural program. This is with the Punk Rock Marthas and most likely the Hollywood United Neighborhood Council. The location on this is to be determined as we are still identifying and waiting to hear back on a couple spaces. So that in short is the set the scene uh, projects that are moving forward and we'll keep you posted on those. Fantastic. Really cool. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody thank you. Anybody have any feedback to Rich on that? Sorry? Anybody have any comments back to them on that? The, the Chase and company. Okay. Um, is there anything else, uh, Chase, to report? You good? Uh, no. Just just to clarify, the the two that have uh, are definitely moving forward are the the first two you saw, the Hollywood Vinyl District and Arts Bridging the Gap. The other two, um, there is a bit of a contingency on property owner approval. Uh, fortunately, those um, we do have room in our goal two budget, so we'll be able to accommodate all four if uh, if we get those approvals. So keep your fingers crossed. Um, always great to, to broaden the scope and, and bring more art to the streets. That's all. Great. Thanks. Fantastic report. Thank you. I'm going to turn over to Brian then and uh, the stakeholders engagement. Thanks, Bill. Um, we'll try to move through this quickly. I know we're uh, short on time. Um, we had a good meeting on Tuesday uh, with Devin. Chris was on the call, uh, Ruben in April. Um, and then we have uh, what we are hoping to put on our committee, uh, Dina Goldstein. Um, uh, presume we need to make a, a motion and um, uh, a vote to bring her on the committee. Uh, she's a property owner here on Sunset. She owns the uh, Dina Art Gallery or Dina Goldstein Art Gallery that's just uh, to the west of uh, Coenga on the north side of Sunset. Um, and she's been there for many, many years uh, and has voiced an interest in uh, wanting to be on our committee. She's uh, been with us for uh, the last couple of meetings and um, we, welcome, uh, we welcome her participation on the committee, if the board uh, would agree on that. So, will you make would you make a motion then, please, Brian? While you're at it, I'll make that motion to uh, bring Dina Goldstein from Dina Art Gallery uh, on Sunset uh, to the Stakeholder Engagement Committee. Do we have a second, please? No second. We got a second there with Leslie. Okay, all those in favor, raise your hand. Okay. All right. Pretty much we got everybody. Anybody opposed? Lower your hands. Anybody opposed? I got through. Okay. We're good. Thank you. Great. So she, that's great. That sounds like a welcome uh, addition, Brian. Yes. Uh, and again, the idea of uh, being inclusive and bring, bringing people in in different aspects of our bid. Uh, that are involved in uh, different aspects of work and retailers, um, I think are a welcome addition to get that kind of input. So we're uh, looking forward to Dina's input on our committee. I, I will also mention, uh, uh, Leslie came in on the call, Chase was there. Um, uh, we had uh, Mitch Jakovic and Joe Rofeld, Re Rayfeld also on the call. So we've, we're, we've got a robust committee Everyone uh, seems to be actively involved and we're, uh, uh, we're rolling along nicely on that. Um, and Chris is uh, tasking us with some uh, interesting challenges coming forward um, uh, with regard to uh, uh, creating some organizational strategies to advance the recovery and unity of our, uh, of our community. And uh, Chris, I don't know, do you have uh, some comments uh, you'd like to make on that before uh, we move any further forward? Um, the only thing I'll add is that um, I, I think there's an interesting nexus here between the nominations process um, and the, um, the organizational statement that was just recently affirmed by the board, um, particularly given the fact that representation, I think is, is something that our board can continue to improve on. Um, as well as our committees and thinking about how we um, can design um, representation better into our process for 
uh, looking to fill those spots. Um, and so that's that's something that I think where goal three and the nominations committee, they sort of overlap a little bit, uh, but I think it speaks to that intent of building an organization that is designed to be more inclusive. Brian, anything else? Uh, well, I wanted to uh, ask Devin to give us an, uh, a quick update on our videography and web design project, and maybe April can give us a quick uh, update on social media. Yeah, I'll just um, say that, you know, thanks to the committee, we did approve a vendor for the videography project, as well as a vendor for our website redesign. Um, and we talked a lot about both of those projects in the committee and got some great guidance from the committee members um, on both of those. So we have our first kickoff meeting with the web designer um, tomorrow morning. Uh, the committee looked at the website and gave us some great feedback as far as what we would like the new website to include. But we'd welcome any feedback from anybody else on the board if you just want to send me an email if you have a chance to look at our existing website. So we will be updating that with a lot more uh, useful information and dynamic um, functions like mapping and things like that on the new website. Uh, with the video videography, they've come out and had three days of shooting in the district and tomorrow will be their fourth filming day. So we will be having some videos to share um, really soon. So we're really excited about all of that. Fantastic, great. April? Uh, the social media audience continues to grow. Um, we are on track to meet our goal of increasing our audience by 50% um, by the end of the year. Um, our engagement numbers are great and uh, we're seeing a lot of interest in our posts about things that the vid is doing to make Hollywood better, um, such as the tree trimming. Um, but we get a lot of great interaction on posts with our clean and safe teams and their activities. So um, I think that shows that we are resonating um, our message is resonating with um, pe with people and we'll just continue to connect and more people will be aware of what we do as we go along. Great. Well, we're really making good progress there. That's a fantastic report. Thank you. Um, anybody have any questions for Brian or the committee? All right, let's move on to goal four then with um, Mike. Okay. Thank you. Um, we had the goal four committee today. Uh, you'll recall that last month, Chris presented a uh, a plan for recovery to aid in the recovery efforts for Hollywood, which will, is a you know obviously a very important issue for all of us. So we we had a discussion today to really think about how we can put that plan into action and how can, we can improve the retail storefronts in Hollywood along the boulevard and other side streets. So um, you know we talked about how, how how to assist owners attract retail tenants. How do we bring in a great mix of tenants? How do we bring in a different quality of tenant into Hollywood, um, the kind that we don't have today? So Chris drew upon his experience from uh, his, his past bids and what other bids have done successfully, you know, empowering owners with good information to attract tenants using data, which as you all know, we've been uh, started working on with our market reports and really understanding what's happening in the neighborhood in a way that you know most owners, particularly owners who are not very involved in the, in the neighborhood, just wouldn't you know have any idea about. So Chris uh, prevailed on one of his past colleagues, Bill King from the Raleigh bid to to do a presentation about how do you actually work with the owners to attract retailers and and ha has it worked? Because you know we don't control the the individual properties; it's they're, they're privately owned. So how can we assist and actually make a difference? So he talked about some of the value add that the bid brought to the to the downtown Raleigh. Apparently, I don't know downtown Raleigh, but apparently it was a pretty dead downtown. Very few stores, some restaurants. Uh, it would clear out at night. So kind of uh, what you think about is uh, you know a lot of traditional downtowns around the country. So they, the bid really added value by, by having data and really interesting data, you know, not just pedestrian counts, but you know, when retail opens and closes, reasons why, food and beverage sales by, by month. Um, and he could, uh, the, the bid could even layer into that data, changes in weather or whether certain events in the area made a difference in those kinds of sales. I mean, some really interesting data that you can manipulate for whatever different purposes for the benefit of owners and retailers. Um, they did a lot of matchmaking, attracting owners to tenants 
and they helped clear hurdles with the um, with with government. So in terms of success, uh, this is something we're going to you know dig into a little bit and and learn more about. But they had a 50 50 percent uh, net gain in in retailers coming into downtown Raleigh. 93 percent of them were locally owned, and there were about a dozen pop ups. So you know it was very intriguing. We would like to take a look at seeing how we can help our owners in Hollywood and make, really make a difference. So uh, Chris is going to present. Um, a plan for next steps at our next committee meeting with some recommendations. And, you know, we're excited to try to see if this can make a difference. It's, you know, the time is now, it's very urgent out there. There's a lot of desperation and it's also an opportunity to really, you know, improve the streetscape of Hollywood. So we're kind of excited about it. It remains, you know, we'll have to analyze whether the effort will be worth it and whether the cost will be worth it. But I think if, you know, if we can improve the, the retail along the boulevard, that'll add a lot of value to everyone's uh, uh, properties. So that's all I've got. I don't know, Chris, if you want to add anything. I couldn't possibly, you did an amazing job. Okay, thank you. Um, we are past our six o'clock mark for the first time that I've been in this chair, but that's okay, because we have a lot to talk, we have a lot to talk about today. So um, before we go any further, is everybody okay with going a few minutes over? Is that okay? Okay. Um, Chris, so I think that on the uh, retail side, there's more to talk about there. Chris, was it, it wasn't going to be a presentation beyond what we talked about that day, right? No, that, we, that, that will be coming to the board next month uh, as a part of that opportunity fund that I talked about in the budget amendments. Okay. Um, Chris, want to go through your report. If you could do it with brevity, that would be great. Absolutely. All right. Um, so you should see... Uh, President and CEO report on your screen now, um, and I'll do this very quickly, just some highlights over the next 30 days uh, between now and our next board meeting. Um, Devin hit on this already, but we do have uh, two videos that are currently in production. Uh, the first one that should be ready will be our urban forestry video, uh, but we have one that started as a pandemic resiliency video. And given um, the state of affairs and civil unrest, um, we are layering in themes um, related to the protests and the riots um, into that uh, broader video. But we're very excited about both of those, which are aligned with growing um, basically information or knowledge of the bid, but also um, our social media following. Um, still trending well on the Hospitality Ambassador Program launch. Um, uh, target launch date is July 6th. Um, we, um, our block by block did hire the program manager whose name also is Chris with a K. So just, uh, to keep things interesting. Um, it's Chris Agaiva, who's, uh, 18 years, um, in the industry. He's a, he's a long time, um, uh, ambassador program manager. So we're bringing in much more experience, uh, which is, is something I'm trying to do in all of our hires. Um, and then. And they're currently in the process of, of hiring for the individual roles with training to be held June 29th through July 3rd. Bill mentioned this earlier, but uh, we are uh, kicking tires um, on, on spaces. Chad's going to be visiting LA next week, and I've been setting up some tours of spaces. Um, and, um, you know, while we intend on evaluating options, um, you know, we do intend to move uh, not very, too quickly, uh, particularly given the fact that the market will likely change over the next quarter um, um, or, or two. Uh, so wanting to know what our options are, but, uh, but also understand the changes that are coming to the marketplace. Um, just as a quick reminder, uh, the application deadline is tomorrow for uh, the board and uh, committee nominations process. Um, and that committee will meet for the first time um, Thursday, June 25th. Uh, so looking forward to reviewing that pile of applications. And I've probably received about 15 uh, thus far. So we uh, will have some tough decisions ahead of us. Uh, Devin also mentioned the web design kickoff. Uh, that, that kickoff meeting is, is going to be tomorrow uh, with a goal of, of launching our new website in October of, of 2020. Um, you know, several highlights that we can expect uh, will be you know, searchable mapped business directory, uh, those types of things that are not included on our, our current uh, site, um, a high degree of mobile integration, so everything will read beautifully on your cell phone. Um, opportunities for civic engagement uh, that are included in the site and, and much more. 
I should also say that the committee hired a firm with a deep degree of expertise in developing websites specifically for urban place management organizations like our own. So we're not having to reinvent any architecture. Um, they have already developed dozens of these sites for other comparable organizations in comparable communities. Um, and so there's a lot to learn on and take advantage of uh, their learning. Uh, and then just a friendly reminder, uh, Brian, I gotta get you a new hat. Um, and so uh, for those who are interested in sporting uh, gear emblazoned with the new uh, 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 organizational uh, logo, please make sure you let Devin know um, if you uh, if you are interested, and we'll get a couple of in each size uh, for the shirts as well, um, so that in, in the event that you you order too big or too small, uh, we'll have ones to swap it out for you. Uh, but just let us know if you are interested um, in in any of that merch, and um, that's really some of the highlights over the the coming months, sir. Right. Okay. Any other comments? Um, thank you for the report. Any new business? We do have one from uh, Jeff Briggs. Jeff Briggs, go ahead. Let's just make sure he is off mute. Can you guys hear me now? Oh, we got you now. Okay. I just wanted to give everybody a quick alert about the possible need for some quick mobilization in the future on the Hollywood Community Plan. Uh, you'll recall that last fall, um, through some old lawsuits and settlements between the city and Hollywood Heritage, there were some urban design guidelines that um, were threatened to be adopted that would have greatly restricted and reduced what had already been approved as part of the uh, Hollywood Community Plan. And among other things would have put an organization like Hollywood Heritage in a position to actually bless some projects. Those plans due to your mobilization and the chamber's mobilization were not adopted, they were tabled and they're not now a part of the city planning department as the community plan moves forward. But there's a new lawsuit by Hollywood Heritage against the city regarding those settlements this new lawsuit potentially puts um, Heritage in a place to have kind of an outsized voice again. And I just wanted to give everybody that alert because you may not, this lawsuit has been a little bit under the radar uh, because of the courts have been closed down uh, under the lockdown. I'd be happy to give anybody any more information they may want about this. I'm not advocating uh, one position or another but it's just that we, we find ourselves in a similar position to we were late last year where one organization in the community has a little bit of an outsized role in discussions with the city. And I think that's something that we're gonna to wanna to monitor and be aware of and make sure we can be a part of that at the table. Totally agree with that. We did, again, we did a really good job uh, and we, we, we were able to get our organization and our machine going very quickly to basically get this in a correct position on the development side for everybody on for everybody who represents property owners in this call, and we will do so again if we need to, if need be. Yeah, just be aware we may need to alert everybody again, and I'm going to try to stay. I'll try to get as much information as I can as this lawsuit proceeds. Very good. Okay. If does anybody else have any new business. If not, I will call us officially adjourned at 6.09. Thanks, everybody. This is an exhausting meeting, and I really appreciate everybody's feedback and thoughts. We have some very important emotional topics to discuss. They're not easy, but I really appreciate the openness with, with the discussion. It was very, very good. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. See Thanks, you soon. Bill. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill.